provided uh, a neat opportunity for me to move to Richmond and be part of that transformation. We're trying to change a lot of our curriculum and programming inside that I'll get to. But we're also trying to change up all the exhibits. And in fact, I was told that it was going to happen within five years. So I said, I've been here four and a half years, and we just gutted a couple weeks ago our last gallery to be changed, which is the one right above us. So we will have changed out all the galleries, and we will have all new stuff less than five years old, which is kind of awesome for a museum. You don't see many places that have that sort of energy to be able to transition through some of those things. So I'm going to do my spiel, kind of going through my life, how I got here, but also then how other people can follow a path that's kind of restless and kind of unusual, but it's also how the museum can help with some of that. So here's the museum. I've worked at several different science museums. This one has the most intimidating looking sort of front <coughs> to it. And I'll say that that's a hardship, not for everybody, to draw for a lot of people that are automatically interested in science, interested in academics. It looks like an academic institution. But if you were a person that had fear of academics or had some negative experiences, it pushes you away. So how do we make people comfortable coming into the doors and taking advantage of the opportunities here? How do we make sure that it's okay to walk in and not know everything? Parents walking off, kids afraid that their kids are going to ask them a question and they're not going to have an answer. So we need to convey that it's okay to say, I don't know. That's a good question. Let's figure that out. It can show lifelong learning. It also shows that you can go to other resources to look for those facts, those, that information, how it applies. So we've been really working with that. In fact, I've had fun trying to show the kids a lot of different things. I didn't actually eat that long there. That was one that they actually found already. <coughs> Just to let you know, trying different things has been something that really kind of sparks kids' imagination. We've actually done bunk buffets, not here, but other places where I've been. We can try them. Usually you try to grab the cicadas when they first come out of their shells, they're a little bit tastier. Oh. <laughs> How does crunchy or so soft? That, that's exactly right. And a little bit of the nutty flavor, yeah. believe it or not, they make good chocolate chip cookies. I'll give you the recipe afterwards if you're interested. So, I actually got my start really enjoying science in college. I explored it in high school. I was okay at science in high school, but I wasn't a great student. What captured me was to move a little bit more of that open-ended exploration. For me, when I was in a high school setting, it was very much cookbook chemistry. It's very much follow these exact methods, and it's supposed to look like this at the end. And the only way I made it through chemistry is because I got the notebook from a kid a year older than me, and I knew exactly how to go through the methods and make sure it looked great at the end. So where I started was something we actually do here at the museum, which I think was fantastic. It was my psychology classes in college. It was training a rat to do anything we wanted it to do. It was an open-ended project. It was an opportunity to do some research and fail, to be able to try some new things and get the rat to do different tricks. Here, we teach kids about offering conditioning and just to let you know the aha moment when they realize, wait a second, my parents give me a treat when I clean my room. Oh, yes. <laughs> Your fancier version of the rat right here. We train them to actually do layups and play basketball. It's actually kind of a fun way to go through the science and talk about the different ways we can use these lessons we learn in small activities like this and see it in the world around us. There's a lot of things we can do but start to take some of those bits of knowledge and actually see where it fits around us. I had an opportunity to teach when I got out of college and I taught physics and principles of technology. My physics class was very rigid. We had so much content we had to go over. We had to teach so many different things. And at the time, I was in Tennessee teaching it. There was text. I was teaching an AP physics class. We had to go through a lot. I was also asked to teach principles of technology class, which is kind of, for a lot of the kids, it was the last ditch science class. You had to graduate to be able to graduate high school. And we took the book. We put it inside of the room. And we said we'd use the book for content as a resource when we needed to. And we had an opportunity to do labs, experiments, the open-ended experiments I talked about in the psychology class. And I got kids that realized that we can apply these skills that we're learning to different situations. So we built a whole bunch of different things. We experimented and failed. But the failure of the experiment wasn't a failure on the text. It was what did you learn from it then? How would you do it differently? How would you go about changing this? 
How does this apply to your life and your world? So we did a lot that had the kids explore and made the science more relevant for them. Just to let you know, here at the museum, we provide that opportunity for high school students in a lot of different ways. And I want you to know it's free. All the high school students, anyone who's not just high school, as long as they get between 13 to 18, they can sign up for the MIX, which is a makerspace for teens, and it's free. They get a free museum membership. They get to come to the museum whenever it's open. During the school year, it's typically open Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday, whenever the museum's open. In the summers, it's open Monday through Friday, noon to 5. This is an opportunity for them to put hands on tools they would not normally get to put their hands on to. This is where they mess up our window boards and make babies learn a little bit about coding. Coming up for Christmas, we actually going to program lights, put in sweaters for khaki sweater contests, and do really neat textiles that way. We've had kids not only learn to fly drones, but build their own out of a 3D printer. We also learned that if you put a 3D printed drone inside of a car on a summer day and it gets really hot, that plastic melts. So we've learned a lot with this with the kids. We have a full TV studio, so some of the kids that can do video applications for colleges can not only just do the video in there with the green screen, but learn to edit and do it correctly, do it well rather than just on an iPhone. And here, we're teaching solder. What's amazing, if you look at that, that is actually, it's my favorite picture, it shows the actual percentages of what we have in the mix. We are over 60% female participation in a major space for teens. That's unusual. And when we talk to the colleagues I have around the country doing that, because we have some great mentors. Jason in this picture, but I have a couple of great female mentors from VCU. I'm too old. I'm not allowed to be in that space. I look like a parent or a teacher. I'm a stereotype for a museum. But we have the kids coming in from VCU. They're hit, they're cool. We'll show you this is what I'm doing for my degree. This is how it applies. And Jason is a marketing person. His art and marketing, but it's showing how STEM and programming all these tools fit into what he does. So the kids are starting to get, ah, science isn't just me becoming a science teacher or a lab person. It fits in everything we do. So it's been kind of fun to see that process. I went from my first teaching job to a museum job. I flipped back and forth between teaching and museum several times. And I love the fact that we had this nice, shiny, digital, quarter acre dome that we can do planetarium shows in. I started with a Spitz 1963 planetarium, the old kind that you would actually have to re-twist all the metal to be able to adjust it to get it to the right time. It was absolutely a fun mechanical device. I learned how to set that up. But it doesn't matter how fancy it is. If you get kids recognizing inside that dome what they can see in the night sky and actually looking up, taking advantage of that, it's amazing what the world opens up to. I can recognize those constellations. I know that that's Venus because it's within so many degrees of the sun on the west side or in the morning on the east side. They start to learn and recognize those things and see the patterns in the world around them. Everyone complains it's getting dark so much earlier, but what was really fun is here at the museum, we set up the windows on the one side of the wall where we marked where the sun rose. Nine o'clock every morning, where's the sun? And you start to realize the patterns that would change over time throughout the year and why. It would seem to get darker earlier, not just daylight savings time, but the light of the day seems shorter because of where the sun would rise. So it's kind of fun to draw some of those connections for people that don't really look at it anymore. Also learn, so you can track the time, effectiveness of exhibits. It's one of the things I really enjoy about this place. I do worry at times about going a little too far, but this is a case to create those aha, wow moments. Schools do a fantastic job of teaching a lot of content, but we want to make sure the kids are excited and enthusiastic about the content as well. They might be really smart and know the information, but if they're not passionate about it, they're not going to go into those fields. They're not going to go into a STEM career or make it through a class at college that's seen as a weed-out class, like sometimes the first chemistry class is seen as that. What gets them through is that passion. So we need to build that up. Our exhibits are a way to develop some of that curiosity and that passion. Where can that take you? Why is NSR 71 built the way it is? And the fact that you developed it, it's designed on a slide rule. We can take slide rules out and show kids how to use a slide rule. And they figure out, wow, this is pre-calculator, pre-computer. But then you also talk about they work as teams. So you've got people with slide rules, several of them, using slide
sidewalk going over the calculations, they were helping each other, making sure they all understood it, and that everything was built solidly rather than an individual designing this. It became much more of a team effort. So we got into the science of the planes, or the other things we have here at the museum. This is just one example. We do, we're starting to, do more programs for teachers and for students based around just the exhibits. We don't do tours per se, we let people go. But I've been trying to promote that the best way to teach informal learning is use the jigsaw method. If you have kids coming in with their chaperones and you've got 10 groups, have them start at 10 different spots and I have the maps broken up throughout the museum. The kids with their chaperones start there and they have to learn as much about that area as possible. Use your phone, take some pictures, do a few of the different activities. Learn as much as you can, then explore the rest of the museum. So when you're back in the classroom, you print that map up on the floor and you say, okay, group one, you started in this area. Come on up and tell us what you learned in that area. And the teacher learns what are the misconceptions that might still need to be addressed and how much did they get out of it. And it also reinforces those concepts of learning in an informal environment. And that's something that can be used anywhere. Theatrical elements of perspective. We have the Carpenter Science Theater here. It took me a while to understand why. I've seen theater in different places, but this is a group here, and these are two actors. They do a fantastic job of providing different elements or perspective to the program. Here is a program called Father Time, and it was one of those things that I really questioned whenever they set it up. They actually do a good job of talking about the very basics of relativity in such an easy way that you can have elementary kids walking through that going, that makes sense. Not the whole concepts of relativity, but just the basics that time is relative depending on where you're at. The idea of looking at four dimensions rather than just three when you take time into consideration as you're traveling through space. It's kind of fun, but if you actually do it in a way where you're going through characters and actors. They also do Tesla and Edison. And that's fun, we do that for older people sometimes, because unfortunately we've had several people say, why are those two people arguing? Well, we have them dressed up like Tesla events, and they start with an argument, a fight in the middle of a rotunda. We've had to tone it down, it's because not everybody got that. <laughs> but for the high school kids, they start to understand, wow, there was a good argument about what form of electricity we should be using. The theater does a fantastic job of putting that in different ways. And for me, it's been setting up the programming a little bit differently. We try to create those moments where people will get inspired. That's a picture of me in my typical weekend outfit running across the block. That's fun if you ever get a chance to run across the block and then stop. And all the kids will see you sink down into it. It's kind of creepy when it's as deep as your ankles. You can't get up right away and you have to slowly move through that. But it's a fun practice. In fact, We've set up different programs where kids can play different things on the weekends, but we also take advantage of unique opportunities that schools can't always show, which is why we should be a tool or a resource. This is our science on the sphere, and it actually sort of animates data that you can see in charts and graphs. We use it right now to really teach the difference between climate and weather, to understand the differences between that. And you can see climate change over time. We use it with the earthquakes that happened in different locations that not only show the earthquake, but then we can overlay the fault lines, we can overlay the tsunami effects that ripple across the world, and we can lay all that out in a way so we can actually see what's happening. This is one of those things that makes it a little bit more relevant, a little bit more understandable, because it is on a sphere the way we think about the earth, rather than just looking at charts. So, teaching people to use these tools, teaching educators to use these tools or come and take advantage of it is really powerful. And a lot of that is for the next generation. I just want to show a picture of me messing up my daughter. <laughs> Anytime you can put over a sentence that had a kiss shirt and shorts, that's fantastic. She would die if I was showing this picture. She's nine now. But um, these opportunities are those we need to create for the kids to get excited about these things and keep them engaged so they understand why it's there. It's also to help you see how you can apply some of this in different ways because you have a lot of great ideas that's come together and sharing those that we can actually get to do some of the different things in the classroom. So let me and let the museum know how they can help in some of that. So that's kind of a quick rundown. Thank you.